to come to Western to share their expertise with us. This is um, going to be a really tremendous opportunity. So I'm going to first quickly just introduce everybody, and then we'll get started. Our first speaker is going to be Michael Torrance from North Rose. Um, Michael's practice includes labor and health and safety matters, as well as compliance advice and training on global regulatory, business ethics, and anti-corruption matters. Included in this is advice in relation to international standards of environmental and social risk management and human rights due diligence, and particularly in the context of corporate and project finance. Um, he's given presentations and delivered training on the equator principles in environmental and social risk management in Australia, South Africa, and Canada, and is the editor and lead author of a book called IFC Performance Standards on Environmental and Social Sustainability. Our second speaker, Ian Osalami, is with Many Life. Um, he's in house counsel for Many Life Bank and Many Life Trust Company. He started his career in litigation and regulatory practice at Bosler's in, in Toronto and has advised financial institutions and specifically banks um, for the last five years or so. He just finished his LLM in business law here at Western, where his thesis was on CSR in the Canadian banking industry, a case study on the Equator Bank. Our third speaker, Mills Engelstad, is with McKinnon Mining. He's responsible for overseeing the legal and corporate affairs of McKinnon Mining. He was previously a vice president of Minera and is incorporated and corporate secretary to the U.S. Gold Corporation. He joined the McKinnon Capital Group of Companies in 2009, and prior to this, he was in private practice with the National Canadian Law Firm. Bernarda Elizalda is our last, but by no means least, Speaker. She is the co-founder and principal of Responsible Mineral Development, and Bernarda is known internationally and particularly in Latin America for her on-the-ground experience at the sites of exploration projects and mining operations, promoting responsible business practices, training, and contributing to the understanding between local communities and the extractive center. And Bernarda assumed the position of Program Director of Sustainable Development at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada in 2008 where she focused her attention on expanding and improving the organization's influence on CSR. She was the key force behind the development and management of what are known as E3 Plus, the framework for responsible exploration, which was the first CSR guidance of its time for the exploration industry. She's also initiated the successful CSR event series at the PDAC conference, um, and at present works as the Corporate Social Responsibility Senior Advisor with Responsible Mineral Development. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panelists. And we'll start off with Michael. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks so much for organizing this. I think it's a really timely and interesting topic, and it's great to see that law schools are taking the lead in educating future lawyers about this topic, because I think it's, it's something that you'll find that uh, in, in the uh, dark recesses of the big law firms, uh, there are very few people who've ever even heard of this topic, even though I think if you looked at their practices, you'll see that it, it, it is actually something that they ought to know because it comes up a lot and is a very important uh, set of rules that their clients are, are required to adhere to in many circumstances. Um, again, my name is Michael Torrance. I apologize for my mustache. It is November. I'm just uh, I was thinking I'm just happy that there's no such thing as descend beard or else uh, I don't think I can do it. Um, uh, I, I am uh, with one of those full right. We're uh, recently uh, merged global law firm and uh, we're developing a practice group that specializes in what we call environmental and social sustainability. Uh, so it's a way for us uh, to fit into the needs of, of our client's business because the sustainability is a very important issue for particularly the extractive sector and for mining companies. Canada has a very large uh, mining and oil and gas sector. So it's important uh, that lawyers for these businesses understand what these issues are and attempt to leverage our skills, which are actually uh, more than many may think in the field of sustainability. Uh, because as we'll see in the IFC performance standards really illustrates the component aspects of sustainability are areas that lawyers have traditionally advised in and are in fact experts in the social governance of these topics. Uh, so the purpose of, of my presentation, I think, is to set the stage uh, to, to introduce what the IFC performance standards are, to give you as the audience a, a basic understanding of their context, particularly in the financing context, and then the remaining speakers will uh, give their very different uh, and, and interesting views on, on how they're applied in practice. Uh, 
How many people here are lawyers? I'd just like to know to begin with, or in law school, I should say as well. So most of you, but not everyone. So my perspective in, in, in uh, researching and understanding and applying the IFC performance standards is as a lawyer. That's not necessarily the most typical approach to take, uh, but when I try to understand what the IFC performance standards are, I, I do so uh, from the framework of, of a lawyer. Um, we, we put together this guidebook that Sarah mentioned. Um, it was a, a very difficult and very interesting process to, to prepare this guidebook. It was myself as well as uh, other topical experts in areas that are relevant to the IFC performance standards. Maybe just to introduce what they are, because we use the, the, the phrase IFC performance standards on environmental and social sustainability. It's a mouthful. There are eight performance standards. The first deals with the assessment and management of environmental and social risks. And it's very much a procedural umbrella to the performance standards. I'll get into the history and how they're used in a moment, but I'll just introduce the topic areas. So the first one is, is about uh, a pr procedure, implementing a procedure within an organization to manage environmental and social risk. Performance standard two deals with labor and working conditions. So that's you know, also inclusive of things like occupational health and safety. It's inclusive of things like human rights and accommodation <laughs> disabilities, for example. Performance standard three deals with resource efficiency and pollution prevention. It's an environmental topic. Performance standard four deals with community, health, safety, and security. So it's, it's basically occupational health and safety, but as it pertains to communities affected by a project. Performance standard five deals with involuntary resettlement issues, which will often come up, particularly in a distractive uh, sector, where communities may actually have to be moved and resettled in order for a project to happen. Performance standard six deals with biodiversity and the management of living natural resources, which is another environmental topic. Performance standard seven deals with uh, indigenous rights. And performance standard eight deals with cultural heritage, which can be uh, related to Aboriginal uh, heritage as well, but it, it could be broader than that to, to manage any sorts of, uh, for example, relics or artifacts or historical sites that could be affected by a project. So these eight topics were selected by the IFC, which many of you may, may not be familiar with the IFC, is the private sector lending arm of the World Bank. So you've probably heard of the World Bank. The World Bank has a, a, a business, basically, called the International Finance Corporation that is focused on interactions with the private sector. And they will lend to these businesses or invest in them in order to foster the World Bank's objectives. And the World Bank's objectives uh, will typically be oriented towards economic development, particularly in emerging markets or less developed countries. So uh, the history and evolution of the IFC performance standards is actually very interesting from the perspective of a lawyer, uh, because basically what they've created is a private regulatory framework that manages environmental and social risks. Uh, this isn't a new thing. It's been around actually since the 90s when they had what were called the World Bank safeguards, which uh, are very similar or were similar to what the IFC performance standards are. But they dealt with primarily environmental risks associated with World Bank investments. Um, and then in 2006, there was a, a reformulation of those safeguards. Um, the safeguards actually still exist, but now only apply to outside of the IFC. The IFC developed a much more comprehensive framework that dealt not only with environmental issues, it dealt with labor issues, as I mentioned, indigenous rights. Uh, so it was broader in its scope, but similar in its purpose. It, the purpose was to basically manage risks for IFC-sponsored projects. And so in 2006 uh, to 2012, uh, there was implementation of that new framework. And then in 2009, there was a review. 2012, the new IFC performance standards were released. And that's the top topic of, of our book. Uh, so that's a little bit of, of the, the history and, uh, and evolution. Let me just take you through sort of how, why they came about. There is, over the last 30 years, a growing body of international law on the topic of sustainable development. It's 
not emerge as a, an obligation of international law, but it is what you might call a, a legitimate uh, objective of international law. So the ICJ, uh, international arbitrators, and a variety of other legal sources have identified sustainable development as being a legitimate objective that they could use in determining disputes, for example. And there are examples of cases that I would encourage you to read. Um, there's the US shrimp case, which is a very leading example of how the concept of sustainable development was uh, applied to adjudicate a dispute between states. Uh, there was also uh, a dispute between Uruguay and Argentina dealing with a pulp mill, where again, that, that concept, and in fact, uh, the predecessor to the IC performance standards was uh, applied by the ICJ to determine uh, a dispute between states. But the problem for the IFC is that international law applies to international actors. The World Bank is an international actor. The IFC is an international actor. Private companies are not. So the World Bank uh, has not only an international legal imperative to consider sustainable development, but that has actually been embedded into their policy as well. So as a policy, the IFC has as one of its mandates, the promotion of sustainable development. But the question becomes is how do they get their private sector partners to care about that as well? Uh, traditionally, and, and why this hasn't been necessarily an issue that, that lawyers have cared much about, lawyers have usually advised their clients, well, you have to do what the law tells you to do. And in a developing country, there may not be a very good governance system when it comes to environmental issues, labor standards, occupational health and safety, human rights. So if, if you aren't obliged to do what the IFC would want you to do by the law, how do you create obligations? And so the IFC performance standards emerged as essentially a private regulatory framework that the IFC permeates through its private sector partners, and they do it through contracts. They do it by embedding covenants within the agreements tied to funds that the private company that's receiving the funds will adhere to the IFC performance standards. And then they've also created a mechanism by which compliance can be evaluated over the course of an investment. Uh, one of the, the, the ways that they do this is they've created what's called the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman, which is a, a I wouldn't say arm's length, but it's separate from the lending part of the IFC that will receive complaints, for example, from local communities and will assess uh, whether or not the IFC has implemented its own performance standards. And in so doing, it could identify instances of non-compliance, which then can be addressed with the, the borrower or the, the financed company. And, and the leverage that the IFC has is to say, well, if you want our money, you have to do this. So, why, why, again, would this be relevant now for lawyers? Well, if you were the lawyer who is drafting the agreement that embeds the IFC performance standards in the operations of your company, if you're representing a mining company, you have to care about this. Because this is a private regulatory framework that it's voluntary in the sense that you didn't have to ask for this money and you didn't have to agree to it uh, in the sense of a state wouldn't punish you if you didn't do it. But it, it may not really be voluntary in the sense that your business may necessitate you getting these funds, and in order to get these funds, you must adhere to these rules. So where they are applicable, uh, they, they become binding for the actors, essentially, that have adopted them. And uh, what do we mean by binding? Well, again, we mean that it's tied to their ability to access capital. And uh, so in order to access capital, they will be part and parcel of the rules that uh, a company is expected to follow. Now, the IFC developed this framework, but they've actually gone far beyond the IFC. Um, there's a thing called the Equator Principles, which is an agreement between 79 of the world's leading banks to basically apply the same approach the IFC takes in conducting project financing transactions. Now, project financing is actually a fairly small amount of global financings. But what I've discovered over the last few years is that uh, these same banks who are uh, committing to apply the IFC performance standards in project financings are, despite not having to do so because of their equator principles commitments, are applying a similar approach even in non-project finance contexts. So, for example, in capital markets transactions, it's a, it's a relatively new development 
that similar due diligence with respect to compliance on the IFC performance standards will be done before a listing. Because as far as some of these banks are concerned, the reputational risks associated with, with not uh, adhering to these international standards would be real, uh, even in, in a situation of putting out a prospectus to the market that would uh, be done before the issuance of, of shares. Uh, that if they are disclosing information about, for example, risks associated with environmental issues or, or, or relations with indigenous communities, the banks want to not be associated with these kinds of problems unless uh, they can be confident that the, the share issuer is, is at least complying with these international norms. So, uh, the equator principles was developed, I'll be very brief because uh, we're short on time, but I'd be happy to answer questions on it. It was originally conceived of as a credit risk framework because banks have basically identified a business objective that to manage risks, um, there is a necessity to uh, ensure that these best practices are met. Now, they won't necessarily ensure a project is sustainable, but they will provide an answer if something happens and uh, they are being accused of, for example, uh, not meeting labor standards. Well, at least if they've conducted this diligence, they have a standard which can be met, and they've ensured that it is being met, that at least they've attempted to meet that practice. It is an answer, even if there are still problems with, with the project. So I think in this respect, it's not really about credit risk, because credit risk would imply that there's some, there has to be an economic benefit. There may be an economic benefit, but this is really more of a regulatory system uh, whereby compliance is done for the sake of compliance in the sense that you do it whether or not there's an, uh, an economic benefit to you if that's realizable because to not do it uh, means you're not compliant with the best practice that uh, is expected of, of, uh, of these banks and their clients by who? By the marketplace. So by your employees, by your shareholders, and, and we're increasingly seeing pressure being brought to bear on banks as well as companies by institutional investors who just expect that this is what will be followed. Uh, so again, I'll just conclude by saying, uh, you know, from, from the lawyer, lawyer's perspective, I think you should be thinking about this as a part of regulatory obligations. Uh, they, these overlap and interrelate with legal expectations and so they're very relevant from a legal perspective. Thank you. 
Uh, Michael mentioned that they've been, there's been an evolution. They were launched in about 2003. They were updated in 2006. And they were updated again recently this summer, uh, although they're in a transi the transition period now, so most of the banks are still operating under the, the Quater Principles 2, as we call them. The interesting thing is, these are developed by private banks, for private banks. There's no real government uh, involvement. And it really has emerged, I think, as a self-regulatory mechanism for international banks. The inter interesting thing from my perspective was that there's seven major Canadian financial institutions who have signed on as member banks of the Equator Principles. They include all of your big five Canadian banks, the EDC, and Manulife Financial, the company I work for. Um, So this is this is the equator principles. This is the EP2. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, principles there. The, the general idea is, if a bank is going to be doing project financing, the proponent of the project or the borrower, the person who's looking at the bank for financing, is going to have to meet certain environmental and social criteria in order to get the money. And as Michael said, I mean, it's, it's a more complicated process than that, and they, they do have loan covenants and things like that. But that's the general idea. They also apply for things like environmental assessments and uh, some other compliance mechanisms. And the idea is, if you want the money, you've got to do these things from the bank's point of view, and the bank is enforcing it. The other interesting thing is, and this is where my research comes kind of, from, my, my master's thesis came. They've also the member banks also have to do public disclosures of the projects that they're financing under the equator principle. So that's an obligation under principle 10. It's called EPFI reporting. So the idea is they've got to have some kind of public disclosure talking about the projects that they're financing, whether they've applied the principles, how they've applied the principles, and things like that. So the fundamental question I was looking at, I mean, like I said, I came at this as a, as a lawyer, as Michael mentioned, but also as sort of someone who's involved on the business side of things as, as working as an in-house lawyer, we tend to get a different perspective because we are looking at it from the point of view of business. Um, and to me, it seems weird, and, and like I said, I did notice this evolution over the last few years in terms of the way people are approaching banking internally, like in-house people and management, but it still seems weird to me as to why private banks, private financial institutions whose goal as so I've always understood it was to make money, why they would be involved in signing up to a program or creating a program like the Equator Principles and why they'd be so um, widespread within the banking community. And that's one of the sort of fundamental questions I was asking. Um, it, that sort of line of questioning leads you into a debate about corporate social responsibility, classical economics, and the theory of the firm, which is this idea of profit maximization, and traditional corporate law, which again arrives as sort of profit, profit maximization sort of outcome, although through a different, uh, through a bit of a different route, they talk, you know, you're talking more about directors' life, or directors' obligations to a company and to further shareholder interest and things like that. But the idea is, there is this sort of debate, ongoing debate that you may have heard of between CSR and these more sort of traditional approaches to thinking about the way we regulate companies and the way we operate companies. So we can talk more about that, and I think Professor Sec has a class on that. So, <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a huge topic, and there's lots of stuff on it if you want to so. Um, So I, I, within that sort of debate, I focus my research more on this idea that exists in the scholarship, which is that banks, and I focus on Canadian banks, but banks in general, plus the equator principles, equals uh, corporate social responsibility. So the idea is the way the banks are implementing the equator principles looks like corporate social responsibility, and is that true? And there are some really good uh, CSR, sort of corporate social responsibility, uh, professors and scholars who are really delving into this. Uh, Professor Richardson, who's now at UBC, is one of them. And then Professor Conley and Williams have looked at the EP specifically. And so that quote there sort of sums it up, which says, uh, by choosing to adopt the EPs, banks have become de facto sustainability regulators. And that's sort of what Michael was talking about. And acting in ways that can only be characterized as both environmentally and socially responsible. So my, my question was, is that true? <laughs> and then, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's true that there may be some CSR motivations, but clearly there are business motivations behind equator principles. Um, the two major ones are credit risk management. I mean, that's obvious. That's why the equator principles were first developed. The idea there is if a bank is lending into a development project somewhere, it's going to face uh, potential environmental and social risks. Those risks 
could jeopardize the completion of that project. And the way that project financing typically is structured is through a non-recourse type of financing. So the bank will get paid as the project is successful and generates cash flow and pays the bank back. That, that again is a really big simplification, but the idea is it's not necessarily secured financing the way you would think about it in a normal banking situation. So the bank actually has an interest to see that the project is completed successfully and profitably. So it wants to make sure that there's going to be no environmental or social issues that sort of jeopardize that. The other idea is it's good for it's good for reputational risk. No no banks, especially these days, want to be implicated with large scale projects that are causing huge and large scale uh, environmental or social problems. Um, so it's good from that point of perspective as well. And actually, the, the equator principles kind of emerged through a process like that, and, and a lot of people refer back to the. Out there, but a lot of people refer back to the uh, Three Gorges Dam in a uh, project in China in the late 90s and early 2000s as a, as a project that really generated a lot of negative publicity for the big international financial players that were back. It's one of the biggest hydroelectric electric installations in the world, and it flooded uh, thousands and thousands of square kilometers in China and displaced the uh, local population. There were a number of potential environmental problems, and actually, there were lobbyists that attacked. Not so much the project itself, but the big American and European banks that financed it. And there were lobbyists against like the credit cards from MasterCard and all these things. So all these banks actually ended up pulling out of the project. Um, so out of that, and that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s, out of that you saw sort of this equator principles, uh, or this thinking that the equator principles made more and more sense. And it wasn't the only project, but it was certainly one of the biggest ones. So my specific research was focusing on this idea that the Canadian, so the big five Canadian banks, so and they're they're a representative of the Canadian banking market, in my opinion, because they, they hold the bulk of the assets. The big five, and, and, you know, you've got TD, RBC, CIBC, BMO, and Scotia, have all signed on as EP banks. And if you go onto their websites, each one of those banks will have a sort of corporate social responsibility uh, website that promotes the bank's CSR initiatives. Um, they make all kinds of you know, broad statements about how great their CSR initiatives are and things like that, how much they're contributing and things. And part of that is the equator principles. They actually rely on them as, as evidence of their commitment to CSR. Again, my, my context was a financial crisis, but we all know about that. So, again, it's just an important point is that, you know, the, the idea of banking is it's not so much, you're not necessarily worried about. Uh, the environmental and social impacts. Typically, when you think about banking regs and things like that, you're worried more about prudential uh, type stuff, like keeping banks safe, keeping the economy safe. But um, so this this sort of research was was a bit hard to justify to, in some cases to my advisor, who was a Professor Nichols here, who was a more of a corporate finance type of lawyer. So uh, in any case, that took some work, but we got through it. Um, so in the end, I looked at public disclosures of the of those big five Canadian banks for the last five years. And I found that each one of those banks was really committed to the equator principles, really committed to CSR, but when it came down to it, um, they didn't actually have that many projects that were subject to the equator principles. So although they made this big deal about having signed on to the EPs, they weren't actually using them, um, even though they said they were. So that was kind of one thing that, that I found. I also was looking at whether they were embedded more broadly in their decision making and things like that. So. Um, We'll get into it a couple slides here, but the idea is uh, the equator principles are in Canada, the banks are adopting them, they want to continue to use them. As Michael said, some of them are even using them in other areas of their business, not just project financing, but there's still some, some work to be done. So no significant project financing. Uh, so that, that led me to the sort of conclusion that Canadian banks really are interested right now, at least in the reputational benefits of the EPs. Um, and that's consistent with some of the existing scholarship in this area, which says that financial institutions specializing in retail services in functions with most visibility are most likely to sign on to the EPs, and that's what was, was consistent with what I've done in Canada. Are they embedded in Canadian banks' decision making? So are, are banks actually using them when they're making lending decisions? I only found that a little evidence. Some of the you know, common Canadian law firms have, have said that the they are providing a framework for, and they are seeing them more and more in, in mining and financing, in financing, financing, uh, mining transactions and things. Uh, and both they may be being used more broadly as an informal standard to manage credit and reputational risk. And Michael spoke briefly about that. 
on that note, the one sort of interesting development I found in the research was that TD is an example where the bank has taken the EPs a step further. So they've actually got a commitment that they've made publicly that they will be using the EPs not only in product financing but across their, all of their commercial lending activity. So it's, it's early days, they've only just made that commitment, but it'll be interesting to see whether they actually do it. Are the other current uh, disclosures credible? Again, I, there were a bunch of issues there in terms of what they're disclosing, how they're disclosing. The idea is they've got to have more transparency and things like that in their EP's disclosure if they really want to be taken seriously uh, as a CSR issue. And so the good news is these are all a step in the right direction. Um, my, my sort of belief is banks are beginning more and more to, to demonstrate sort of CSR type behavior. And then there's uh, still significant room for improvement as we continue to see the EPs evolve and the Canadian banks' uh, scope of involvement. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you here today. With an audience of lawyers and about to be lawyers, uh, there's going to be a disclaimer. Uh, and that is the opinions that I express and views in the States so my mind alone, not necessarily reflect those of my good colleagues at the q and um, I'm a mining lawyer, and so this is a really interesting panel for me to participate in. I am not an expert on CSI, uh, and I'm not an expert, I'm not even that knowledgeable about the queer principles. Uh, and so I'm taking this opportunity to learn as well. Uh, and my colleagues already have given you a much better overview than I could, could ever um, I would take a slightly contrarian view and suggest that as a mind lawyer in the junior and mid-market space, I don't actually encounter the equator principles that frequently. Uh, though I wish I was more, and I'm delighted to hear Michael mention that it's permeating into equity capital markets as well. As from my vantage point, there's simply no exposure and there's very little expectations from financial so in doing this, I'll draw on some of my experience. I'm going to share with you some stats and some numbers. Um, and I'm going to give you a sense of how I actually encounter these issues in practice. Um, I'm going to use a, a few slides in doing this. First slide, the photo right here is a photo that I took. It's of McEwen Mining Tosazula's Copper Project, which is 4,500 meters up in the high Andes. Uh, and it's claimed to fame at the moment, other than being one of the largest undeveloped copper projects in the world, is that it was the subject of a complaint to the Canadian Corporate Social Responsibility Council. Um, although it's not a bragging right, I'm probably one of the few in-house council who actually has experience dealing with a complaint from the CSR council. I'm going to keep some of the facts and figures very basic. And that is, let's put some scope and, and figures around uh, the equator principles and the mining sector as a whole. So total number of mines in the world, these are rough numbers because you simply don't really know. 2,500 industrial scale metal mining operations. It ignores all rock quarries and, and, and other extractions. Uh, excludes small, small scale mining operations. Uh, the estimate for China alone being 8,300, which is quite astounding. And the point I'm trying to make here is that there is an incredible opportunity for project finance if you have 2,500 operating mines. Um, and so the question then is, where, where do I then encounter the equator principles? Um, and the equator principles, as we've heard, apply to, to product finances. Uh, though I think, from a mid-market and junior sector perspective, the thresholds for application are actually quite high. And they, I might have my correctly if my figures are wrong. But they apply to product advisory services, where the total capital cost of 10 million or more project financial total capital cost of 10 million more, or project related loan, where the majority of the loan relates to the project, total aggregate loan is at least 100 million. Uh, each equator principal financial institution has to be 50 million, and the loan tenor has to be two years. What I'm going to tell you is that miners, probably more than individuals in any other sector, are creative little buggers when it comes to raising money. And so where do I not encounter? the equator principles, and where do I hope that the equator principles or some derivative of the equator principles may be encountered? The first is equity capital markets. And that is the obvious counter to project finance or debt finance. 
Uh, but there's so many other financing methods used in the mid and junior sectors. So royalty grants, stream financings, corporate loans, offtake agreements, offshore agreements, joint venture financings. Uh, and without discussing the full mining cycle, you'll note, note that much of the things I just mentioned happened pre-construction or pre the need for project financing. Um, and I would say that for the junior sector or mid-tier sector, even going into production doesn't necessarily involve a significant amount of project financing. Generally, it involves a collective of equity, debt, royalties, streaming, put into one financing package. I'm going to share some numbers with you about the global mining sector. <coughs> this is quite common. There are more mining companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange than any other exchange in the world. Almost 1,700. It's quite astounding when you look across. Even uh, exchanges like the NYC have only 128. Mining equity finance by like Lansing. Uh, the TSX in 2012 did 1,700 equity finance deals. That's, I think, quite remarkable. And then when you look at the percentage of mining companies on the TSX and TSXV by stage or project, you'll find the ones that are in development phase or production phase, and you just that sliver at the end. And so most of the people, and the point I'm trying to make in part is that most of the people are working in that 80, the 0 to 90% to threshold and have very little opportunity to encounter with greater principles, in part why it's so important that we have these discussions of law schools and we have these discussions of business schools uh, and elsewhere. My point is, I think there's very little capacity, and unless we continue doing what I just mentioned, we're never going to see a lot of these people ever get to that. Point. Okay, um, no. Let me see that actually. Maybe not. Um, one of the anecdotal points that, that I was hoping to make on that last slide, if I could get back to it, uh, is the academic literature, literature connected to corporate social responsibility. And these are my anecdotal findings. But as a, as a private market securities lawyer, what I overwhelmingly see, and this is anecdotal, is that academics and policymakers are generally preoccupied with equity market interventions, whether Dodd Frank disclosure requirements, shareholder acquisitions, et cetera. Uh, and so, where can we help make the equator principles in these equity market sector interventions coincide? I'll look to my colleagues during the discussion for that. Um, well, location and ownership. You know, if you believe corporate social responsibility is culturally, you know, culturally nuanced, uh, that can require specific on the ground inside offensive project expertise, you will find that 48% of Canadian mining projects located abroad are actually in poor countries. And further, that the expertise is actually quite segmented. So if you look at, this is by asset, 50% of Canadian mining assets abroad by asset value are in the hands of seven companies. 90% of assets abroad are in the hands of 70 companies. And so the point I'm making here is that you know, the exposure to good corporate social responsibility dialogue and training due to having colleagues in house that are experts, etc., is actually in the hands of a select few people. Now, what do, other, what, what do the other 90% do? Well, they explore. And so global exploration expenditures estimates for 2012, 21.5 billion. And you'll know from the previous slide that there were 1,700 equity financings, raising 10.3 billion. And so you have two numbers, 10 billion, 20 billion. I think these are relevant numbers. But what about project finance? So these are numbers from Thomson Reuters who do an annual survey. And they got figures on project finance. And these are numbers from the mining sector. Uh, and so what I think this does is it raises the question of how, you know, how relevant is project finance to the sector period. Uh, and you look at $4.5 billion. Total market shares, 2.3% of global finance deals. And it came in the form last year of 15 issues. That means syndicated issues, so there were slew more banks 
actually involved in, in providing that financing. Uh, unfortunately, the data does not provide information as to whether the elite were a player principal financial institution to provide it. Now, take a step back and realize that private finance in general, on average, is about 5% of a bank's book of business. And then look at the context of the, the mining finance. You'll actually see that it's a small segment. So my objective in, in, in coming to talk about this is have an open dialogue as to how we can expand it to other methods of finance. Yeah. I agree with my colleagues. These are incredibly important principles for lawyers. Because the guidance you will take from the project of finance will help guide equity, will help guide those other types of finances. Um, I think as a sector, we're probably getting them to them too late if we don't encounter them until we're looking at private finance. Has anyone in our mind, in the mind, as I, I hope a lot, a lot of people in the mining sector know and understand, is that good corporate social responsibility doesn't come when you just look for money. It has to start the day you put the first bill to or acquire the ground or acquire the property. Uh, and so there are many other frameworks that are incredibly valuable. Orders, the E3 put up by the PUSC. Uh, I do think there's a point to be made that good corporate social responsibility directly tied with consequences to fundraising is important. Um, and I would suggest that a global framework or a standard framework that literally took a project from exploration down to reclamation would be helpful in this context. Um, Sarah asked me to briefly touch on the Office of the Extractive Sector Corporate Social Responsibility Counselor. Um, and so the CSR Counselor was a program initiated by the Government of Canada in 2009 as part of the broader CSR Extractive Sector Operating Overseas. I won't go into the strategy itself, but the Office has an advisory role and they have a dispute resolution role. And the dispute resolution role is a community-based mediation process that is wholly voluntary. And so, what are your predictions if you have a wholly voluntary process, and on one hand, you have a project affected community, and on the other hand, you have a mining company, perhaps not with the capacity to fully understand the implications of the complaint, but without sufficient corporate knowledge. And so, I would argue that success has been pretty good. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there are two outcomes here that you could suggest maybe some success. First, quantum and new goal. The new goal report is an MPN. And these are statistically insignificant and largely anecdotal findings. But it's worthwhile saying that you know, two that third the best were the two largest mining companies on the list. And so is there a correlation between having in-house capacity to deal with these issues, having much higher exposure to reputational damage and risk, and willingness to participate? I don't know. Um, and I have to also reject my own thesis because my company's name is up there and we withdrew from the process because I didn't think it truly applied to, to our circumstance. Um, and, and so having participated, I too am a critic of this process. You know, I don't think it matters if you're a hard miner or if you're an avid NGO, anti-mining advocate. I think this being a voluntary process without any enforcement mechanism, and frankly, based on experience, a very nominal public shaming, uh, I think it's an inexpensive way for the government of Canada to say, we have a process in place for that when they ask about how you deal with the behavior of Canadian mining companies abroad. I'd be happy to speak afterwards about the specifics of the complaint faced by the human mining uh, tied into glaciers, our project in Argentina, and I think quite uh, It's worth noting too that as of today, or as of a few weeks ago, there's no longer a CSR counselor in place in position. So, you know, some closing thoughts for me, other than the continuous, continued encouragement to to suggest some capacity to build across all types of financing in all sectors, uh, miners and non miners alike. Uh, you know, I, I asked the question of if, if lenders can actually make efficiencies by regulators. Um, 
And then I thought, you know, evaluating the effectiveness of the regulatory regime is actually quite difficult. And so if you assume that regulation means, you know, setting the standards, overseeing them, and then enforcing them, I'm okay with one of the two, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm quite there yet with respect to the enforcement. And what happens when the project finance is paid back? That is a lingering question. Uh, without sounding overly cynical, as I reviewed some of the literature uh, for this presentation, I came across a quote from a US lawyer who said, the future of the greater principles depend on the overall state of the global economy. Environmentalism is a rich man's game. Greatest enemies of environmental progress include recession, protectionism, and fight for capital. And the cynical part of me says banks are probably no exception to this. But I'll leave a positive note. Every little bit helps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh -huh.
money that they were able to, to get to start doing all the research that they had to do during exploration. So not only that they have uh, financial uh, uh, limitations, uh, but, they, but we can add that having the limitations on human resources, at least as uh, we just said. Um, and, and given that they, uh, they are mostly worried on the technical part, then uh, not only that their, uh, their employees are not uh, well prepared in most uh, cases to work in CSR, but they have hundreds of contractors that don't even know what CSR is about, and the company doesn't have clear policies on what CSR is and what they are expected in the future. So we just continue to multiply and uh, with uh, employees and employees that uh, could escalate in time and, uh, and in the level. Thank you. 
why we, we decided to develop as much information as we can, and also because each project is uh, is like a person. They are they uh, like each person grows with a specific environment, with a specific context. It has a different uh, a specific uh, story to tell, and uh, people that are around them are different. Same thing with projects. So given that each project is different, uh, so different challenges. Thank you. 
share uh, in the sense of uh, there, there are different authorities than just states when it comes to CSR. So Bernarda is, is and, and PDAC is an authority in the sense that uh, somebody who has an expertise and who can uh, use that expertise to develop standards that other people will follow in order to uh, achieve a goal like social license to operate, those standards can become the prevailing norm. The interesting thing about the IFC performance standards, I think, is that over the last 10 years, we've started to see a convergence uh, as the, the IFC performance standards are, are sort of moving to the forefront as being the standard of choice. And one of the key reasons for that, I think, is because of the equator principles. The role that the IFC performance standards plays in financing is uh, sort of creates an inherent incentive for those that will be seeking financing to, to follow them. And so the marketplace is, 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 is again, driving the adoption of, of these standards. Another one we haven't mentioned is ISO 26000, which is also a very uh, important set of standards. It takes a different approach. It's not as substantive in the sense that it's, it's more procedural. Um, but that could become the standard, for example, that many companies uh, adhere to. So I think it's sort of in flux as to what the dominant standard will be. But the IFC performance standards is certainly becoming the most, the most important. Yeah, and I, just to touch on the idea of uh, the sort of theory of regulation, I mean, that, that can be a very academic conversation in terms of you know, the new forms of regulation that are emerging around the world and things like soft law, and a lot of people point to the equator principles as an example of soft law, so the idea is almost like a self-regulation with a you know, hard enforcement mechanism. Um, there are certainly, there's certainly a lot of data around that subject. It becomes also more of a practical issue as well for companies, and, and especially in equator principles, because Theory aside, how do we enforce the principles? How do we make sure the companies, our banks, are actually doing what they say, what they say they're going to do? And one of the major criticisms of the equator principles, but also sort of soft law, self-regulation initiatives in general, is they may lack the necessary enforcement mechanisms to actually achieve the goals in the CSR goals and to achieve the CSR goals that they're after. Um, and that's something I think that most people are still thinking about. I don't know that anybody's really arrived at an answer for that yet. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep it very brief. I like the analogy of projects so like, like people, but building on that standard sort of like the mentioned as well, they evolve. And, you know, it's, it's nice to see you know, people from major financial institutions and industry groups and massive global law firms that have such a pragmatic outlook on the evolving nature of the soft law. You know, from an in house counsel perspective, this is something that, this is a knowledge and process that I'm going to have to translate to geologists and engineers, et cetera. And that capacity being built with professional service providers and financial institutions. From the industry perspective, I think it's actually very, very helpful. And we have that for questions at this point. The mining industry is obviously going through some difficult times right now. Um, you know, fingers crossed it picks back up. But sort of in an era, very like in a time period where things, companies are struggling and are finding it difficult to even finance these projects, how is it that you know you could convince your clients or your company that these are things that they need to be looking at and that this is something they really actually have to focus on? Sure, but you know, I, I think your your outlook can be one of two. It can be one that CSR is another department, just along with your technical department, your finance department, etc. And when you make the cuts, you make the cuts to the ones that are least necessary. And CSR, frankly, I think across the board tends to go first, along with other what, what the geos consider sort of soft departments. Um, the, way, the way to change that is to, to, to stop looking at corporate social responsibility initiatives as a department or separate business function of a company and instead look at it as the new reality that you adhere to globally, whether in your finance function or your corporate development function. It, it is an overarching layer that is superimposed upon the sector as a whole. And I think, you know, if you talk about it internally in a company like that, uh, you know, 
when, when you cut CSR, you're cutting everyone's department. You're cutting portions of everyone's. And that is my, that in practice, however, very, very difficult to implement. And so in these economic times, I think you're right, you're going to see cuts to, to, to the, the good that companies do or the adherence to, to, to those standards. Um, just like to uh, go back to CSR is also about building up relationships. And just because you are going to solve financial situation, uh, if you have a friendship relationship with somebody, just because you have solved financial situations, you will say, I'm not your friend anymore. Uh, you have to keep uh, building up on that relationship, making them know that they are respected, letting them know that they are heard, letting them know that things are being done to help them avoid all the risks that your uh, practice is going on. So uh, when uh, CSR issues are not built on in time, it just becomes like a pressure cooker um, that sometimes at some time can explode when uh, we can just start to do that and there's lots of stuff about that. Yeah, and just to, to build on uh, Fernando's point, I think health and safety is a great example. There's countless examples in history of companies that have decided, you know, we can save a little bit if we just cut back on health and safety start to adopt an economic model for whether they're going to comply with health safety. And then you get the one in 10,000 situation that happens and sometimes the company doesn't exist after that. So it, is it, can it be a strategic move to cut back on something? Uh, well, it's, it's like cutting back on any risk management uh, aspect of the company. You can probably do it for a time, uh, but you know, is, is, that, is that good? risk management, and I think that, that what, what we're seeing now, too, is, is a lot of thought being given to what are the duties of boards, for example, what's the duty of a director? And, and the duty of a director is, is to, to take reasonable care to address risks that are facing a company, and uh, it's, it's been found in law to be permissible to give account to environmental and social issues in managing risks, and, and I think from a business case, I think there's probably more than simply the permissibility of it, I, I think there's an imperative to give consideration to these things because they can have such massive consequences when they go wrong. Um, so there are laggards, there's no doubt about it. There are free riders, there are people and companies who, who may decide to achieve an economic advantage by not considering these things. But uh, like any uh, risk management exercise, doing so you do that at your peril. <laughs> companies don't deal with CSR, uh, they become less uh, financially attractive because uh, the finance sector doesn't want to uh, put in money in companies that have a negative legacy because that will end up in a big problem for them. They can lose their investment or they can have uh, lots of more costs uh, in, as a consequence of that. So uh, cutting on that uh, will be Yeah, we 
risky categorization, then it will have to apply a more rigorous sort of EP framework to assess the project, have an environmental and social management plan in place, and those kind of things. So it, it's, a, it's a great question because, as Neil referred to earlier, actually, as well, is the EPs work great from an initial point of view. Um, they don't always work great once the project is done, financing is complete, and the legacies are still there. The bank is pulled out, there's no more oversight, but the timing is a, is a key issue. In, in Junior level 
uh, companies do not get any exposure to the EP3 um, and so they're sort of later in, in a later stage and they're asking, you know, looking for more money, sort of IPO stage. I'm just wondering what the environmental risk, like the exposure to environmental risk is at those levels of those junior and mid-level uh, and if, whether we should be concerned about um, the library. Sure. Okay, yeah, I mean, first of all, great question. Uh, that, that sort of takes you right into the heart of the whole discussion on, on CSR versus, you know, cor corporate profitability and things like that. And, you know, we can talk for a long time on that, but in the banking context specifically and in the context of EPs, I think management of the banks, and it's most of the big banks across the world now that are signed on, like you know, so, you know, so I think they make the case internally, not only to shareholders, but to their, their boards and to management, that the EPs are actually really good for business. And they, they don't make the bank less competitive, they make it more competitive. Because they help with things like risk evaluation, upfront environmental due diligence of projects. We don't want to get into things where we can't get the money out of, and that's part of part, part of making sure the project isn't going to have a huge environmental or social issue. So I think these days, management can make a pretty good case that adopting the EPs is actually good for the bank's bottom line. And, and no one's really thought that yet in terms of studying the profitability associated with, with them, but I think that that's the case that's made in general. Just a couple things to add to that. Um, I think, uh, well, at least the anecdotal evidence that I've heard recently is that you will have far more, in fact, you will almost exclusively have resolution, shareholder resolutions, asking questions about why is it there more governance in relation to environmental and social issues than saying, why are you doing this? So it's the, actually the opposite, that, that the shareholders are actually questioning uh, management and boards as to, as to what CSR uh, governance regimes are being put in place. And so uh, the, the pressure, particularly from institutional investors, they see this as part of their risk management framework. There's another uh, thing that we, we haven't mentioned, but it's the principles for responsible investing. There's, there's literally hundreds of in, uh, large investors that are members of that, and part of the requirement of being a member is that you ask questions like, you know, what are you doing in respect of environmental risk management, social risk management? So the impetus from shareholders is actually to adopt more compliance, as far as I've seen. The other thing I will say, though, is that there is, um, in terms of reputation, I think there is a bit of a disconnect, I think, between Western banks, for example, and perhaps other uh, investors that are, uh, you know, historically, for example, uh, state-owned uh, enterprises in China, for example, have been known perhaps to not necessarily apply the same rigorous standards and maybe have derived some benefit from that. But I think even in China, there's now uh, a lot of discussion about CSR, and there is a recognition that having not adopted these standards in the past has actually maybe narrowed their access to markets, for example, because they've been viewed as maybe not a good actor. So. Um, reputation, I think, would drive adoption more broadly uh, rather than to narrow it because the question will be, if your competitors are doing it, why aren't you doing it? There must be something wrong with your risk management. Now, I'll, I'll tackle the question, uh, you know, environmental risk at the junior and mid-level. And, you know, there's no argument that, on one hand, from a technical and sort of physical environment risk, it's probably less. There's nothing to ruin a, a, a mining project like a breach of a, of a massive tailing stamp or a cyanide spill, right? These are always quite significant things as opposed to what actually happens during the grassroots exploration stage. But you know, the, the environmental risks to a company, and risk not being just harm to the physical environment, they're significant to the middle of the stage and at the exploration stage. You know, I think you don't need much of environmental non-compliance to encounter significant reputational risk, and often at the local level, significant per future permitting risk in order to move a project forward. And that's, you know, I think that's particularly relevant, at least in my experience, in the, in the US and the southern US and in states like Nevada. And you can have, you can have small environmental spills that can delay your project by substantial periods of time. 